Hello guys. Um, in this lecture, we are going to go over the brakes and clutches, and we are going to evaluate uh, the frictional torque uh, that gets developed during a clutch or a brake. Uh, the main difference between a brake and a clutch is a brake is uh, usually used to um, absorb the kinetic energy from a, uh, a, a shaft, uh, while a clutch is used to convert or transmit the mechanical power from one shaft into another. And uh, we are going to look at uh, uh, two different types of clutches. Uh, one of them is uh, the positive contact clutch, uh, which is uh, this shaft, for example. Um, this is meant to be engaged at a very low speed, obviously, because you have these T's, and then on a separate shaft, basically, you are going to have similar T's, and when you engage them, basically, the, you know, uh, the force on this surface is gonna be transmitted to the other shaft. And this also comes in a, in a spline design, for example, in this spline design, you have this be your input shaft, and then this is the output shaft, but again, you cannot engage this at a very high speed because you may risk, for example, to break the teeth, etc. In the case of this, uh, this uh, clutch, um, we can, for example, find uh, the torque that gets transmitted or the force on every face over here. And then in this equation, basically what we have is uh, the torque applied on this uh, clutch is equal to N, where N is the number of faces that are in contact. So each element of these basically will only have one face. So you have torque here and a torque here, and then you can have N of them. So N times the force times the moment arm. In this case, the moment arm is the mid-range, basically, which is RO plus RI divided by two. So RO plus RI divided by two, is the mean radius of the force. So if I take n times the mean radius times the force is gonna be equal to the torque, the total torque that is delivered by this shaft into another uh, shaft that is part of the same clutch. And I can essentially find the stress applied on uh, one of the surfaces by looking at the force that is applied. And obviously n here is a number of phases. So by increasing n, you increase the number or you, you decrease the stress on an individual uh, teeth or a spline element like in this case. And um, like, for example, in this guy, you have so many teeth and obviously you can here transmit more torque that you could do in a, in a small shaft like, uh, like in this case. And the bearing stress basically that is gonna be uh, developing over here is gonna be equal to one force divided by the area. In this case, it is a B, which is a thickness of that times T, which is the depth or in this direction, right? So B is a, you know, is a thickness and then D is, is this element right there. Um, we won't be dealing a lot with these types of uh, clutches. We are going to be dealing in our course mainly with this clutches or, you know, uh, what you uh, know from, you know, uh, some of you from your experience, you know, like uh, uh, disc clutches essentially that you find in your uh, automatic transmission vehicles. Uh, and the purpose of this uh, clutch disc in this case uh, is to transfer a torque from this incoming shaft into this outside shaft. And then let us actually look at the equation that actually will uh, be here. And I want to stop this video so we can actually uh, work on it. And uh, what I would like to do is I would like to do a very brief uh, recap of uh, friction on, and how friction basically gets developed. So there are essentially two types of friction that you can deal with on element on, you know, uh, a small element type, uh, you know, conceptual uh, elements. So if I have this, um, this object and, um, you know, let's say you have a force, uh, you know, P applied on here. Obviously, I'm going to have a reaction force N over here. And if this object is trying to move to the right, then obviously I'm going to have a friction that is developing over here. And if I have that the coefficient of friction here is mu K, then the friction is actually going to be equal to what mu K times n, right? Where n here is basically equal to p. So this is called asperity contact. And in the case of asperity contact, the friction will always be mainly proportional to the normal force. It's actually unrelated to the velocity. So no matter how fast this object is moving, the friction on it will always be equal to mu k times n. And then this is called 
asperity contact friction all right now in the case where uh, the similar object is sliding on this you know on the surface but now instead of actually having a friction coefficient um, let's say this part here is actually lubricated where you know um, with it where you have a damping coefficient of b in this case if this object is moving with a velocity v then the friction on this object will actually be equal b times v so the friction is going to be proportional to the velocity by the damping coefficient and we won't be dealing with those in the case of clutches why because we know that clutches are asperity contact uh, friction devices uh, where uh, the friction is going to be directly related to the normal force and then not the velocity all right so bear that in mind while we do our analysis and uh, let us actually consider the situation of those of this uh, this clutch basically the disc clutch is like that right and this is on on this side and uh, what you are going to have is now we're gonna basically forget the angular velocity in between them and uh, what we will have is obviously we need to have a normal force in between them and uh, essentially the frictional torque that is going to be developed between this plate and this plate regardless of this angular velocity right regardless of this angular velocity the friction will actually be the same on this guy it's going to be mainly proportional to fa and it's going to be related to it by the normal force that is going to be developed so let us actually uh, look at that and um, you know again and uh, draw like a diagram where we can see how the friction is developing on this disc so let us say that this is a disc and um, and let us actually take one element on that disc and uh, what i'll say is that you know the radius set is actually uh, up to on this element is r and let's say this guy is ro and uh, let's say you have a board in this guy and that radius here is ri and uh, essentially we have a a force that is basically applying or a pressure that is basically creating friction between this disc and the disc that is on the other side so i can say that this is my element da and if this guy is r right then the distance from here to here is going to be r d theta right where theta is simply you know the angle that we are using as our reference and this distance from here to here is actually equal to our uh, dr right and this particular element right um assuming uh, that uh, we have a uniform pressure on this element right and this is going to be a major assumption that we are going to use right now so if you assume uniform pressure on the disc then what i can say is i can start to relate the frictional force that is developed by this element da right and um, i know that the normal force on the element da is going to be equal to what it's going to be equal to the pressure right at this uniform pressure it's constant multiplied by right and then i know that uh, the frictional torque that actually gets is developed over here so a small element friction or small df is going to be equal to mu times dn right so the friction on this element is equal to the coefficient of friction multiplied by dn and i know that dn is going to be equal to the pressure times area so i can do it right here so mu times the pressure times uh, the da right which makes sense so pressure times the area is equal to the normal force once you about the coefficient of friction is going to give me that friction coefficient. or i'm sorry it's going to give me that uh you know that tiny friction force that is applied on this uh, element now i can actually write the torque that is that that friction 
force applies on this element as dt. So dt is going to be equal to r times df, right? And uh, r times df is going to be equal r mu p times dA. Now, what is dA? So uh, dA here is going to be equal to r d theta multiplied by dr, right? r d theta is the lateral change, and then dr is a radial change along that uh, element. So here, I'm going to replace dA by its value. So I would have r u p, where dA is equal to r d theta multiplied by dr. So I'm going to uh, rearrange that a little bit because I have r, so that would be r squared. So mu p r squared d theta multiplied by dr, right? So this is the change in the torque as a response of, uh, you know, where the radius is right now and then the changes in theta. So from here, if I integrate that, I should be able to get the total frictional torque that is developed on the plate. And... Um, to do this, I'm simply going to integrate uh, dt from zero to t. And on the other end, I'm going to, so I have two variables, so I have to do double integration. I can, and you see theta is independent of r, so I can do zero to two pi. And r essentially will go from the inner radius, so we can call it ri, and on the outside, it's gonna be ro. And again, mu p r square d theta times dr, and here, to integrate that, I'm going to end up mu p 2 pi, because the pressure is constant. We assume we have uniform pressure throughout the disk. Mu is going to be here. D theta is 2 pi. And now integration of R squared is going to be R3 over 3. So R3 over 3 integrated from Ri to Ro. And that is going to lead me to mu p 2 pi over 3 r03 minus ri3. All right, so now I need to know the pressure, right? And, you know, I assume that uh, the pressure is, is uniform in this case, and I was able to bring that pressure and then put it before the integration and then do it from here. So if the pressure is uniform, you can actually relate the pressure to the axial force that we are applying, and then which was here, right? So the pressure that actually develops at this interface right here, is related to the axial force that we are applying on these plates. And again, the frictional torque that you are developing is gonna be on this plate equal and opposite, right? So it's gonna be like that and like that. So each plate is gonna be equal and opposite to frictional torque. And the pressure in this case is gonna be equal to, we know the pressure is the force over the area. The area that we have is pi r O square minus R1 square. So I can simply take this value and then plug it in the equation which I just obtained. So let us uh, reorganize and uh, rewrite this whole thing again. So now your change uh, or your total torque basically that we had solved for, right? Total torque on one end of either plates is going to be mu P uh, 2 pi over 3. And I know the pressure is going to be equal to the force, right? Or, you know, the, the axial force or the, you know, in the case of the real transmission, basically that force is actually applied by a spring that is actually mounted inside your transmission to push the clutch blade when, um, you know, when you basically retract the clutch. Uh, okay, so that would be pi r square minus r1 square. And we can actually plug that back here. So your total torque, frictional torque is gonna to be mu multiplied by Fa divided by pi Ro squared minus R1 squared multiplied by two pi over three Ro cubed minus Ri cubed. And Ri here is basically R1. And I see that pi and pi will actually cancel out. So I'm going to end up with mu Fa 2 over 3. Uh, all right, so uh, that is your, your frictional torque that gets developed on one clutch plate as a result of 
this axial force on the disc on the clock. Um, so uh, if you recall uh, what I mentioned earlier regarding our assumptions, and uh, when I was earlier relating the torque to the frictional force or, or the torque basically to FA um, at that stage, right? When I said DTF was equal to mu pressure multiplied by R squared multiplied by D theta by dr. When I continued from here to arrive here, that uh, I assume that the pressure is constant, right? So this torque, you should only use this frictional torque equation only if pressure is uh, uniform or constant along the the clutch uh, the clutch discs right and what i mean by that is let's say this is your you know one disc and then you have uh, another disc on the other side and basically when you apply this engagement force fa to basically clamp these together so you can generate some friction torque over here essentially uh, the points which are here actually are going to see a bigger pressure so if you actually plot the pressure on this disc uh, the pressure will actually look like that kind of and then here it's gonna look like that so here you're gonna have the maximum pressure over here and then the pressure on these ends will actually be a lot smaller all right so if this is my radius right if i'm actually if this guy is a radius measured from you know where you are to you know where you are along this guy right anywhere this is a radius um and this is how the pressure is going to look like so the pressure is going to be maximum over here but actually when you go on top because this plate actually has low stiffness on the top, you won't be actually able to develop a lot of pressure on here. So the pressure will actually vary throughout. And uh, what will actually happen is that the pressure is going to be equal to the maximum pressure, which is on the inside, multiplied by the inner radius divided by R. So this is how the pressure will be distributed. And when you have this type of pressure distribution, essentially, instead of uniform pressure, we are going to have uniform wear. So the wearing of the, of the plates will actually occur simultaneously on both ends, and you're gonna have wear throughout. So this is called uh, for uniform wear. So assuming here wearing is gonna be taking place throughout, and this is what actually happens in the case of the pressure. So the pressure is gonna be, a lot more on the inside than on the outside. So now I can recalculate this equation based on this pressure equation, and then I can solve for a different frictional torque on individual plates based on this pressure distribution. So uh, let's do that uh, now. So I'm gonna uh, write this one more time. So U multiplied by the pressure, R squared, d theta uh, times dr and i know now p is equal to the maximum pressure multiplied by r i divided by r so we're going to take this pressure and then we're going to plug it here and now we're going to end up with this view pressure which is p max r i over i multiplied by r squared multiplied by d theta multiplied by dr so i can see that r at the bottom and R squared will cancel out. So mu, pressure max, and then maximum pressure is a constant right now. That is not changing, times dr. And now I can simply integrate this guy to get the total frictional, total, uh, and then I have here these two uh, variables, so zero to two pi, and dr is gonna vary from the inner radius to the outer radius. And I'm going to have tf is going to be equal to we can quickly do that right now. We have P max, mu, Ri, uh, 2 pi, and R outer minus Ri. So this is your, I'm sorry about that. So this is your frictional torque in the case of a uh, uniform error. So on the final exam, uh, you need to be very mindful of these two equations, right? So this is the equation where you have uniform wear, and TF is going to be equal to, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to be equal to um, FA U uh, 2 over 3 
and that is in the case of um, uniform pressure. Okay, uh, so uh, that is in the case of uh, the uniform pressure. Okay, and in the case of uniform wear, uh, most of the time when you are buying um, a disc plate, uh, the, the manufacturer will actually tell you what is the maximum pressure that you can put on this plate. And you know, the maximum pressure is independent of the materials, whatever, right? It is mainly just a function of the maximum pressure. So if they gave you that, the maximum pressure on this plate is that much, it means that whatever your geometry is, you cannot violate this maximum, uh, uh, this maximum pressure and um, what we can do right now is um, what if uh, you know they ask the question uh, given the maximum pressure what is the maximum force that you can apply on the disc brake right um, so here basically we can um, you know revisit our element that we said earlier we said tfa Right, the change in the axial force that you apply is basically equal to the pressure times da and then i think this is something that uh, it's pretty basic, right? So if this is your, you know, your clutch and then you're taking this element DA, and I know I have a pressure element, pressure value over here, then um, then DFA, essentially the axial force that would correspond to this element DA having that pressure is gonna be PDA. And I can, uh, I know the pressure is gonna vary, right? On along this radius from here to here, right inversely so i can integrate that so i'm going to write and this is again for the uniform wear so this is p max uh, multiplied by ri over r multiplied by da and then we said uh, da is always uh, dr right the change along the radial direction and the change along the theta direction which is a transverse direction along the circular direction so uh, this is going to be your uh, dfa and you can see that R here and then R there is going to cancel out, right? So you're going to end up with P max, Ri, uh, dr, d theta, and that is your uh, dFa. And from here, you can get your uh, total force that is needed to, or the, the maximum force that corresponds to this, to this maximum pressure, right? So if you integrate that, you're going to end up with Fa, P max, Ri, and 2 pi ro minus ri right and uh, let me actually rewrite this uh one more time again so by doing this essentially you are finding um you are finding the maximum axial force that you can apply on a clutch right so fa is equal to p max multiplied by ri multiplied by 2 pi multiplied by rho minus r i. And again, this is only based on Pmax. This is for uh, a uniform wear clutch. So this is maximum axial force to be applied on a, on a clutch with Pmax limit. Okay. And that is it, guys, regarding the analytical work. And uh, essentially, you have three equations that you should be familiar with. The first equation is uh, torque on a clutch on one end of you know of the clutches for a uniform wear, frictional force, frictional torque for uniform pressure, and for uniform wear, we also have uh, this equation where you have basically a pressure limitation on uh, the clutch, right? So this is going to be your maximum axial force. And there is actually one axial force that the maximum axial force that you can get on a, a uniform pressure, uh, on a uniform pressure clutch, which is this one. And I'm gonna actually leave this for you. How would you get FA for a uniform pressure disc? So I'm gonna uh, leave this for you guys to, to do on your own. Okay, I'm going to continue guys with this one. Like I said, in the case of a clutch, the frictional torque is independent of the velocity, right? Why? Because it is a spirity contact. 
if you instead had a torque converter, right, uh, then the fluid will actually depend on, uh, or the frictional torque is going to depend on, or the or not necessarily the frictional torque, right? So the torque that is basically transmitted to the other shaft would be a function of your angular velocity, right? So this thing you actually find in your manual car transmission, right? In your automatic car transmission, you are going to find a torque converter and torque converters basically they use fluids here and that is why in the case of your automatic car right you can keep the engine idling right and the car won't shut down right or won't turn off because you actually allow the engine to rotate at, at a low velocity uh, without creating a lot of frictional force on the engine to stop it right okay so uh, just some you know overall uh, you know descriptions on that uh, obviously uh, the axial force can be applied by mechanical means you know lever springs linkages you know all kind of you know mechanism you could use to create that fa that we have been discussing or you know pneumatic pressure electromagnetic or whatever uh, the advantages is that there is a very little shock during the engagement and this is what i was mentioning earlier right in the case of this frictional break uh, or this, you know, friction type clutch um, by engaging the output shaft on the input shaft, you can start from a very small velocity and then you can increase that engagement by controlling the pressure in between those two clutches. Um, so, uh, uh, like, I, uh, like I mentioned earlier, so if the clutches are flexible, right, uh, basically, ultimately, you can obtain uh, uniform pressure on the friction surface uh, if these two are flexible, so they will conform ultimately, and they would give you that uniform uh, pressure. Uh, so, just the rule of thumb here is that if the if the clutch plates are flexible, then you are going to have uniform pressure, and uh, so you will get uniform pressure if you have basically flexible uh, flexible plates, right? And if you actually have rigid plates, you are going to get, uh, uh, then you are going to get uniform wear, right? So this is, that basically relates what we discussed in our analytical analysis. Okay, and this is basically uh, what we just described earlier, right? So in the case of a, a constant uh, wear, basically this is the equation that we did for the pressure. We said it was inversely proportional to the radius. And this is what we did here. And then ultimately uh, you can get your frictional torque like, uh, like this one, right? And then you can actually uh, do one more thing. And then by relating Pmax to Fa, right? The, the axial force that I described earlier, you can actually get the torque as well in this simplified way, right? So in this case, you can relate the torque to Fa, or if you have Pmax, it is going to be equal to this. Uh, these are just some various coefficients of friction uh, for, you know, metal on metal, for example, your coefficient of friction is going to be 0 0.25, and the maximum allowable pressure of a metal on metal clutch is going to be uh, 250 PSI. Uh, and uh, that table might be a little bit outdated. So obviously with new developments and, you know, braking systems technology, you can probably reach higher pressure than that. Um, and obviously you have, you know, like, you know, wood on metal or, you know, uh, molded blocks, uh, basically plastic. So asbestos on metal. So um, asbestos is a material that has been used uh, you know, almost like, you know, 20 to 30 years ago, and the asbestos are known to create cancer. So the people no longer basically use asbestos in this. So you can pretty much, you know, just take some, you know, rough values from the coefficient of frictions and then ignore the rest of what you are seeing here. And then uniform pressure is what we uh, described earlier, right? So that is a torque equation that you would get in the case of a, a uh, in the case of a uniform pressure on the clutch. Uh, okay, so, you know, uh, th there is really no difference between the clutch and the brake, right? Essentially, the brake is 
essentially converting your you know your 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 the energy from a shaft into a non-moving shaft basically where your you know which is your pads basically are not moving relative to the disc right uh, versus in the case of a clutch uh, the whole system is rotating but in a relative velocity but the whole idea is uh, it, you know the fact that you have asperity contact or metal on metal contact then the velocity won't, won't depend right and then this is what we've seen from developing the torque equations the torque equation you never see any angular velocity or, or anything like that so these are some types of uh, brakes or clutches i'm sorry uh, so or even a brake right so uh, this is a centrifugal type clutch right and uh, this guy is you would find for example in you know many small engines uh, or you know uh, mechanical saw engines for example uh, what you have is uh, is this centrifugal clutch and as a result of uh, the engine right or you know this usually like you know one stroke engine usually reaching up some velocity basically this clutch will essentially open up and it's going to engage on this housing and then basically that way you can have engagement from the motor down to your transmission so this part would be connected to your transmission right so again so at low rpm basically this guy wouldn't touch because you have the springs compressing this guy to the sky right uh, this would be an extension spring that you have between those two laces and as a result of uh, having high rpm the high rpm is going to create high centrifugal acceleration and then it's going to separate these two uh, uh, these two elements and then by uh, applying pressure between this guy and this guy, you basically uh, create force on your transmission. Okay, so uh, again, this is your you know typical axial clutch, and um, again, this is also a centrifugal clutch. So some of you may actually wonder why you actually have these springs over here. So the reason why you have springs in your clutch is to absorb the initial engagement of the clutch. So in the load line, basically, when you engage your clutch plate, first it actually engage on the outside, and the load will basically travel through these splines, I'm sorry, through these springs, and then the springs will basically apply the force on the spline, which is your, your second shaft. So this is a shaft that actually gets connected to the shaft, but in the load line, basically, you have these springs that dampens a little bit basically the sudden engagement of the clutch. Again, this is a centrifugal clutch and as I mentioned earlier, as a result of the high velocity on this guy, right, uh, you are going to develop centrifugal acceleration and then these guys are trying to go out radially and by, you know, going radially basically they would engage on a bore that would allow you to transfer the torque between two different shafts. You could have a multi-disc clutch basically, um, you know by having you know one side you can develop one frictional torque if you are having you know if you are clamping on a plate from two sides you can you know double the frictional torque right and then by having multiple plates you can actually increase your frictional torque a lot and they could use this they use these actually in you know aerospace applications where you need to uh, you know create huge frictional torque in compact packages Okay, this is a type of a uh, a, a electromagnetic uh, coupling, uh, basically, and you know you don't need to uh, you know uh, worry about that. Uh, but you know, obviously, it is you know very possible by implementing an electromagnetic, basically, by uh, creating a, a flux that would actually engage or disengage a clutch. Um, what I'd like to do here is that uh, let us actually go over this uh, example very briefly and um, you know it's a very straightforward problem. Um, so what we have here is that uh, you have a single plate disc clutch right with both sides of the plate affected. It means here that uh, we are applying a friction on both ends of the plate so you have to make sure that you know the area would be twice the area that you have. So this is, is to be used in an automobile. Uh, the friction coefficient uh, for the contact surfaces is 0 0.3. So this is our mu K. And the maximum allowable pressure is 15 PSI. If the inside radius, so RI is eight inches and the outside, ra outside radius is 10 inches, we need to find the torque that can be transmitted and the actuating force. So basically what we have here is that we have geometric limitations on the clutch. 
which are given to you by the inner and outer radius of the clutch plate. And we have limitation on the material uh, by knowing that the maximum pressure that we can apply on that material is 15 PSI. And we know that the maximum coefficient of friction of that material is 0 0.3. Uh, so we need to find the torque and uh, engagement force FA that is required to develop that torque, right? So first of all, we begin by finding the torque and uh, we have two things that we could assume, right? You could assume uniform wear or you could assume uniform pressure. On the exam, I will tell you if it is uniform wear or uniform pressure. And if I don't tell you, you have to assume what you did. And like I said, on the final exam, you are going to be submitting your handwritten solutions to me for me to grade them. All right, so if you assume uniform wear, we are going to use the equation that we developed. And this is from what we just described you know, a few minutes ago. Uh, we'll just apply it as it is. So P max is 15 PSI, mu F is 0 0.3 and RO and RI are given to us so we can directly solve that and then this is your torque for one side right like i said one side if you are doing the two sides basically you are going to double this right and that would be your torque the actuating force also we have solved for it using this equation and then uh, 2 pi RI p max RO minus RI so you are going to end up with this is actuating force and in the case of the uniform pressure you can do a similar procedure and then you can solve your torque and then once you get your torque you can get your your force and the force here is you know also related um, um, to you know pi p max r o square so i left that equation for you guys to derive right and um, and uh, you know this is very simple based on what we discussed earlier, right so this is actuating force on a disk is constant pressure so so this is what you are going to end up with okay guys so the last slide here is um, okay so by the way here if you look at the torque that we got so when we assumed uniform pressure we obtained 8874 right and when we assumed a a uniform wear we got 8140 so the torque that you get for constant pressure is more, right, is larger. And uh, this basically compares what you actually, uh, the results, the frictional torque that you get as a result of assuming uniform pressure or uniform wear. And it turned out that at some point, right, if you can basically, if you actually dimensionalize these equations, Right, so D over D, where D is the inner diameter and D, large G is the outer diameter. So, so there is a spot basically where you are here at, at, at this point, basically your assumption would actually, it wouldn't matter uh, if you assume uniform pressure or uniform wear, right? So here we are dividing the torque by coefficient of friction, right? F friction coefficient, force is actuating force, and then D is a, is a larger diameter, right? So, uh, so that is what it is, all right? So at some point, basically, if D over D is, is large enough, basically, if, uh, you know, your inner diameter is technically approaching your outer diameter, right? Uh, it means, basically, your bore is large. That is what it means, right? And even at 0 0.75, so, you know, your inner could be like 0 0.75 and your outer, um, uh, and your outer is one, so large G could be one, small D is 0 0.75, so you're operating at that point, and then even here, basically your assumptions would be very close to each other. Um, okay, guys, so uh, that is it regarding that. Uh, I'm going to uh, add, you know, one more lecture, basically, in which we discuss, you know, self-locking breaks and a little bit more about where, and uh, that would uh, be it regarding our course.